in our last topic, we talked about viruses and we talked about how they can trick cells, how they basically take over the machinery of a cell and convince the cell to, first of all, make copies of the genetic information and also use that information to make more virus. Technically speaking, the virus is a little more than a pocket, a bag of information. We have that protein capsule, and then we might have an envelope around that, but the main important thing within a virus is the information, and that information is being injected into the cell. We, as humans, can do the same kind of stuff that viruses do. So we now have the technology to take bits and pieces of DNA, stick them together, and insert them into cells. And again, because the genetic code is universal, whatever cell we stick that into will decode it and will use it if we provide the proper signals. We could, for instance, take a gene from a jellyfish that codes for a fluorescent protein and put that into a fish. And that's what you're seeing here. So we've got three populations of fish here. These are danios. It's a common aquarium fish, but these guys have something additional added to them. They have a gene from a jellyfish, and this codes for, like I said, a protein that would normally fluoresce. It would light up if you expose it to UV light. So we've got some very decorative fish here. They're very colorful because of that additional gene that has been added to them artificially. Today, we're just gonna talk about how we cut bits of DNA and stick them together and insert them into other organisms. Next lecture, we'll talk about the applications of this. And we'll also come back to these fish and we'll talk about why someone decided to do this. More specifically, what we're talking about today is recombinant DNA technology. Recombinant DNA is exactly what it sounds like. We're taking DNA from different sources and recombining it. So we might take DNA from one organism and add it to another organism. So we take a piece of DNA and we incorporate it into the genome of another organism. Incidentally, that's what a lot of viruses do. Viruses that cause latent infections, if you remember, they insert their DNA into the host cell DNA. In this example here that you're seeing on the screen, we have a bacterium, it's got a plasmid. Not to scale again, I really wanna stress that plasmids are really tiny compared to the chromosome. And then we've got some DNA from a cell of interest. Maybe it's a human cell, maybe it's, you know, whatever, it doesn't really matter. We can take a piece of DNA and insert it into the plasmid of the bacterium, and because the code is universal, we don't have any problems. We can take that plasmid and stick it back into the bacterium, and then every time this cell makes copies of itself, every time it divides, it makes copies of the DNA as well. Every time the bacteria cell divides, it clones that DNA. Now clone is used in a few different ways. When I'm saying that we're cloning a piece of DNA, I just mean we're copying it. If we're talking about cloning an organism, well, that's a different thing. And we will talk about that in our next topic. But anyway, every time this recombinant bacterium divides, it's gonna make copies of that DNA. And let's say that's all we want. We want lots of copies of this particular piece of DNA because we want to sequence it. We want to see the actual code. Well, this is one way we can make copies. There are easier ways to do that, one of which is PCR, which we'll talk about in a moment. But also, we could tell that bacterium to actually express this DNA. So let's say we put a piece of DNA in there and it's a complete gene with all the sequences leading up to the gene. So we have the enhancer sequences, the promoter, all that stuff. It's all right there. So the gene will work if we put it into a living cell. Well, we can trick the bacteria cell into making that protein. 
So what you're seeing in these examples here is we've taken genes that we're interested in and maybe again we just want a bunch of copies of it to study it we can do that and that's what's happening on the left side of the diagram here but maybe it's a gene that codes for a protein that's really important to us we might want to study the protein or you might want to use that as a pharmaceutical so for instance you could take the gene that codes for growth hormone and this is a hormone that's expressed during um, fetal development and childhood development that increases the rate at which bones grow etc it's an essential um, hormone if you're going to achieve full stature we could take the gene for that particular hormone and we could take it out of a human cell we could put it into a plasmid and then put that into a bacteria cell the bacteria cell will divide we'll get a whole lot of it and then we tell those bacteria cell go ahead and decode this and make protein out of it and then we can extract the protein so we grow up lots and lots of bacteria they make the protein for us this growth hormone and then we can purify that and we can inject it into uh, young children that aren't making enough of this hormone so they can grow properly we can also make copies of proteins and, and hormones and so on that are important for blood clotting or are important for lowering blood pressure etc so if you need to make a drug that mimics a compound that's already found in humans it's very difficult to go out and find enough humans and take enough blood or take enough tissue to extract this yourself it's much easier to find the gene that codes for that protein stick it into a plasmid stick it into a bacterial cell that will then make lots and lots and lots of the protein and you can purify that we'll start by taking a look at the tools that molecular biologists have at their disposal for manipulating dna it really is a lot like arts and crafts we have enzymes that we can use as scissors we have means of lining up the pieces and we have a glue which is ligase that we can use to stick the pieces together we'll look at some of the actual physical tools that are used in the lab as well so what you're seeing here is something known as gel electrophoresis we're seeing fragments of DNA so DNA has been separated out by size in solution and we can see those different sized fragments being lit up here let's start with how we cut DNA so by the 1970s people had figured out that DNA was the genetic material of course and they'd figured out that DNA is used to make RNA and that's used to make uh, proteins so we had a good understanding of how that worked the genetic code had been cracked by that point and we had like I said a good overview of the whole process and people started to think well how can we manipulate DNA we'll talk about the ethics of doing that in our next topic but it could be something as simple as turning off a certain gene to figure out what it does that's something that biologists do quite frequently to figure out how genes work so in order to understand cells and understand how hormones and proteins and all these things are used in the human body we do need to figure out how to manipulate the DNA in the 70s people had discovered a big group of enzymes known as endonucleases so a nuclease is something that cuts a nucleic acid so RNA or DNA endo means that it cuts it in the middle of the sequence it doesn't just chew off the ends there are DNA endonucleases known as restriction endonucleases that are produced by bacteria mainly to protect themselves against viruses remember that bacteriophages insert their DNA into bacteria and then of course the virus takes over and ultimately kills the bacterial cell well these bacteria as a defense they have these enzymes that will gobble up the viral DNA anything that's foreign 
and cut it into little pieces. What was really interesting that they found in the 70s was that these endonucleases cut at very specific points. There were many different endonucleases, different ones for different species, and they recognize very different sequences. This was really important because as we discovered more and more of these enzymes, and there's thousands of them known now, we now have enzymes that will cut at very specific sites. And if we want to cut out a piece of DNA, all we have to know is the sequence of the ends. We can find an enzyme that will recognize those sites specifically. We can cut it out, we can stick it in somewhere else. So as an example here, the first enzyme you see, something known as ALU1, this guy up here, it looks for this very specific sequence of nucleotides, AGCT. Now notice that this is a palindrome. A palindrome is something that reads the same forwards and backwards. So race car. Race car, if you read it one way and then read that word in the opposite direction, it's the same word. It's not quite the same thing here because we're looking at the bottom strand. So on the top strand, we have AGCT. On the bottom strand, so I read across this way, on the bottom strand, if we read in the opposite direction, we have AGCT. And these restriction sites, they're called, where the enzymes bind and cut, are always palindromes like this. Read one strand one way, read the mirror image in the opposite direction, you have the same sequence. Mm -hmm. Now, this particular enzyme will always cut between the G and the C on both sides. So it will cut right down the middle here. Please excuse my slopping, sloppy drawing. We end up with what are known as blunt ends. So we're going to split this piece of DNA into two parts. Um, and you can see that on the right of the diagram. Now have a look at the second enzyme here, something called echo R1. The echo stands for E. coli. That's where this enzyme was discovered. And here we have a cut that's offset. We don't get blunt ends, we get something called sticky ends. And that'll make more sense in just a second. But this enzyme looks for this particular sequence, G-A-A-T-T-C. And again, if we read that backwards on the bottom, G-A-A-T-T-C, it always looks for that particular sequence. And when it cuts, it always cuts between the G and the A. So here and here here and it's going to separate the two strands across the middle that's going to give us these sticky ends they have this overhang so you can see our first strand has an overhang on the bottom our second strand has an overhang on the top and why that's important if we cut another piece of dna with echo r1 we get the same sticky bits they're sticky because they want to produce hydrogen bonds the A's want to bind up with a T if they can find one. The T's want to bind up with an A. The C's want to bind up with a G. So if we take a bunch of DNA that has these sticky ends, and they're the same because we've cut them with the same enzyme, then when we throw them together in a test tube, they will naturally come together. Let's take a closer look with an example here. So at the top, I have a sequence of DNA. The dot, dot, dots suggest that this is a much bigger piece of DNA, but this is the section that I'm going to introduce a cut. We have another piece of DNA on the bottom, shown in green, and this is where I want to cut it. And then I want to bring these cut pieces together. I'm going to use the enzyme we just talked about, that's echo R1. Remember that it looks for a sequence G a a t t c so take a second and see if you can find that on the top remember it's going to be the same in the opposite direction on the bottom and when echo r1 cuts it cuts between the g and the a so for this sequence of dna if i expose it to echo r1 it's going to cut here and I'm going to keep the piece with this overhang that's attached to what I'm interested in. I'm going to cut the 
other piece with the same enzyme. So once again, look for that sequence GAATTC. Again, it's going to cut between the G and the A on the top strand and the bottom strand. And when I make that cut, I'm going to get this. And that's the piece I'm interested in keeping. Now what I'm going to do next is throw these pieces of DNA into a test tube together. They are going to naturally come together. Everything's in motion in a test tube. Things are moving around. They're bopping into each other. They're constantly colliding. And when we have these two overhangs coming together, they will line up because of the hydrogen bonding. The A's are looking for T's to bind with. The T's are looking for A's to bind with. This is a very stable configuration. Now, of course, we wouldn't just have two pieces of DNA. We'd have millions of pieces of DNA. We'd have a mixture of DNA, but some of that DNA is going to end up the way we want it. And we do have ways to screen for the products that we're interested in. Another look at the same thing with the same enzyme echo R1, we've got a piece of DNA here that has that sequence that is recognized by echo R1. Echo R1 will ignore any other sequence. That whole sequence has to be there. It sees that it cuts between the G and the A and we get our two sticky ends. In this particular example, we cut a piece of circular DNA. So we cut an echo R1 site in a big circle of DNA, a plasmid, for instance. What we're going to do now is we're going to take that cut plasmid and we're going to combine it with a foreign piece of DNA. Maybe it's a gene that we're interested in. We've already cut that gene with the same enzymes. So it has the same overhangs at the end. So this is a multi-step process where we have to cut the plasmid first, and then we have to cut our target DNA. And there's probably going to be some fragments of DNA that we don't want, so we have to get rid of them somehow. Usually they're smaller, and there's some chemical means we can use to remove them. But once we have fairly pure samples of the DNA we want to stick together, we bring that together in a test tube, and they will align themselves. They'll align themselves in some other ways as well, but most of the fragments of DNA will align as we're hoping. The last step is to glue everything together. We've thrown some foreign pieces of DNA together. They've stuck because of hydrogen bonding, but they're not held rigidly in place yet. We need to form some new phosphodiester bonds. Remember that we had this problem when we talked about DNA replication. We have these gaps here. DNA polymerase cannot seal those gaps. And this was an issue on the lagging strand. We were left with these gaps that had to be sealed. What does the cell use? It uses ligase. And that's what we use. We throw some ligase into the tube and that acts as a glue and it permanently seals those pieces of DNA together to give us our recombinant DNA molecule. This whole process takes place in a test tube. It doesn't take place in a cell. We have DNA from a plasmid that we have cut. So we put a nick in this circle of DNA. We have our insert, which is our target piece of DNA that we want to make copies of, or maybe we want to decode it and make a protein from the code that it contains. We've thrown the insert and the plasmid together after we've purified them into a tube and then we have added ligase and ligase will magically seal those bits together, especially if we use bits that have these complementary sticky ends. Complementary just means they have the same sticky ends. So we cut the two pieces with the same enzyme, ideally. That's the simplest way to do it. We seal this together and now we have to get our plasmid back into a bacterium. When we do that, we say that that cell has been transformed. It's been changed because it has new genetic material that it didn't have before. There's a few ways to do this transformation. One thing you can do is you can take 
the bacteria cells, you chill them first down to about four degrees, and then you add in some of your plasmid. The plasmid will stick to the outside wall of the bacteria cell, and then you rapidly heat the cells and then chill them again. And what that does is it shocks the cells. It causes these little openings, these little pores to form within the membrane, and the bacterial cell will take up the plasmid. Another way to do it is you can take little tiny, tiny microscopic invisible particles of gold and you can stick plasmid to that. And there's a little tiny, tiny gun like machine that you can use to actually shoot holes into bacteria cells and introduce the plasmid. Another way you can do it is you can electrically shock the bacteria cells and that creates little holes in the membrane that they can repair but it allows the plasmid that's in the solution around the outside to be taken in. So there's many many ways to transform the cells. In a lot of cases you're going to kill the cells but bacteria cells reproduce very very quickly so even if your solution contains only a handful of cells that survive this and take up the plasmid they will survive. You can grow them up and you can isolate your plasmid later on. It's important to note that if you're a researcher, you don't need to make your own plasmid, you can buy one. So you can buy a tube of plasmid, just a few microliters, they're pretty expensive, but these are plasmids that you can insert into bacteria. And you have a lot to choose from depending on what you wanna do. What you're seeing here is a plasmid that's commercially available. Don't worry about the name. It's just a pretty typical one. And it's got a few interesting properties. First of all, it has a gene. It has a sequence of DNA that will make the bacteria resistant to ampicillin. Ampicillin is an antibiotic that's pretty effective at killing most bacteria. So if we take this plasmid and just simply stick it into a bacterial cell, it will be resistant to ampicillin. Now, why is that important? Well, in a lab, you have a lot of bacteria that's just naturally growing. It naturally grows all over, and that bacteria might contaminate your plates. You can make Petri plates that have agar on the bottom. That's the stuff that you put the bacteria on, and it already contains ampicillin. Any natural bacteria that might contaminate it won't grow, but your bacteria that have your plasmid in them they will be able to grow. I should mention that the bacteria that are used in labs to do this kind of research, they have been crippled. These bacteria have to have special things given to them in order to survive. Their main chromosome has been damaged or mutated in some way. But in any case, any bacteria that grow on your plates, if they have ampicillin added to them, we know that they have to have this plasmid. That's helpful. We also have an origin of replication. Of course, we're always gonna have that. That's the sequence that's recognized by the enzyme helicase that opens up the plasmid and begins replication. We have something else here known as the LAC-Z gene in this particular example. And that's an enzyme that will break down something in the plate and cause the bacterium to change color. We'll get back to why that's important in just a second. Embedded within that LAC-Z gene, we have something called the multiple cloning site. This is the most important part. This is where you will stick your piece of DNA. So notice that the multiple cloning site, it's highlighted down the bottom here. So they're showing the sequence of that multiple cloning site. And there's a number of sequences that will be recognized by restriction endonucleases. Our favorite one that we've talked about a few times, echo R1, is right here, G-A-A-T-T-C, right there. So we could cut our piece of DNA of interest with echo R1 on both ends, and then cut this with echo R1, and we can stick the two together. Now, when we do that, if we're successful at doing that and we take our plasmid and we get it back into the cell, 
then it will have interrupted this LACZ gene. This LACZ gene won't work anymore. Normally, a cell that contains this plasmid, if you give it the right food, it'll turn blue. If we have successfully inserted something into that multiple cloning site, the LACZ gene doesn't work. And now you look at your plates and you see some cells that are white. You know that they have this plasmid because they grew. That means they have the amphicillin resistant gene. And we know that we successfully put our foreign DNA in there because they're not blue. So there's all these very, very cool little tests that we can use to see if we were successful. Here's what we might see after trying this transformation with this particular plasmid. On the left, we have the plasmid and we're going to make a cut with a restriction endonuclease within the multiple cloning site. And again, for the sake of example, let's say that we use ECHOR1. We have a lot of other things to choose from, but we have the sequence down here for ECHOR1. We've cut our plasmid within the multiple cloning site with ECHOR1. What we do next is we take our DNA of interest. Maybe it's from a tomato plant, maybe it's from a wombat, maybe it's from a human, whatever. We're going to take that, we're gonna cut it at the ends with ECHOR1 as well. And now we have sticky ends that are complementary. We're gonna take our plasmid, we're gonna take our insert, our piece of DNA of interest, we're gonna throw them into a tube together and let them stick together. Now, in some cases, the plasmid's just gonna close up again. So remember, we have ligase in there to glue things together. In a lot of cases, the plasmids are just gonna be glued back together. But in some cases, they're gonna have the insert inserted and then be glued together. We take that mixture, we add it to a solution with some bacteria cells in it, and we heat shock the cells or we cause them some other sort of distress that makes them take up this DNA. And we see if the plasmids become incorporated. We take that and we put that onto a plate, a Petri plate. So it contains this nutritious agar and that agar also contains some ampicillin. So what does that mean? Any cells that didn't take up the plasmid at all will not survive. We won't see them. We incubate this overnight, we're not gonna see them the next day, they're gonna be dead. The ones that take up the plasmid are going to survive, they're gonna give rise to colonies. If the plasmid also contains our chunk of DNA or any chunk of DNA, then that will interrupt the LACZ gene and that means that those cells will be white and not blue. If that LACZ gene is functional, the cells will be blue. The reason for that is that the LACZ gene codes for an enzyme that lets them break down something else that we've added to the agar ahead of time. And that particular thing, when it's broken down and used for food, it turns blue. So if they have a functional LACZ gene, they turn blue. If they don't, that's a good thing because it means that we managed to insert our DNA and the colonies will be white. And now what we can do is we can take a look at this plate. We can pick off the little white colonies. We can transfer that to other Petri plates or other tubes and grow it up. And now we have a whole lot of bacteria that has our plasmid in it. And that plasmid contains that piece of DNA that we're interested in. We could perhaps encourage those cells to make protein out of those uh, pieces of DNA. We'll talk about that more next day. It's important to remember that this whole thing only works because DNA is a universal code. It's something that popped up very, very early on in the Earth's history, about 3.8 billion years ago when the first cells appeared. And that code has been conserved through the history of life. So DNA from any particular organism should work in any other organism with very few exceptions. As we talked about with viruses, 
even though they're not technically alive and they're just bags of information, that information can be read by any cell. If we have this particular sequence, we can stick it into any cell. That cell will understand how to interpret it and it will turn it into a protein. Go and take a look at your laundry detergent. It probably contains some enzymes. There will be lipase, and that's an enzyme that breaks down lipids, so greases and fats and so on that might stay in your clothes. And there will probably be protease or proteinase. That's a different word for the same thing. These are enzymes that break down protein. These enzymes were originally recognized, identified in bacteria, and they were found to be very useful. What researchers did is they hunted down the genes that coded for these enzymes, and then they improved them. So they improved the genes, changing a few nucleotides at a time, and then they put those genes back into bacteria, and now those bacteria produce a new and improved form of lipase and protease that can be collected and purified and added to laundry detergent. On the right, what you're seeing here is a pharmaceutical. There's a number of pharmaceuticals uh, and hormones that are produced in this manner. Insulin is a really good example. If you're diabetic, there's a few reasons that could occur, but one of them is that you're not producing enough insulin. Your pancreas produces insulin, and insulin tells the cells in your body to take up excess glucose. So if you cannot produce insulin yourself, you are not utilizing that glucose and your blood sugar levels go quite high. People who have this type of diabetes need to inject themselves with insulin. It would be very difficult to collect enough insulin from human volunteers to do this. In the past, what was done is insulin was collected by taking it from the blood of horses. So horses are quite large. They don't have to volunteer. Uh, they can produce a lot more insulin, but even then, not the best solution. There's still not enough insulin that we can get just from horses. And also it's horse insulin, it's not human insulin. It's pretty similar, but it doesn't work quite as well as human insulin would in the human body. So what's been done for a few decades now is that we've been using recombinant insulin. We've taken the gene for human insulin from human cells, cut it, put it into a plasmid in a bacterium, and now the bacteria make human insulin. Of course, human insulin serves no purpose for them, but we've tricked them into reading this piece of information and turning it into protein in pretty much the same way that a virus would do the same thing, hijack a bacterial cell. So we're hijacking the cell, we're telling it to take this gene for human insulin, copy it, and also turn it into protein that we can then collect and we can give that to people with diabetes. We can use this technology to do some rather weird things. What you're seeing on the left is a tobacco plant that actually will light up in the dark. It has a gene that we've introduced into it that was taken from fireflies. Fireflies use this gene to make an enzyme that causes a chemical reaction that gives off some photons of light. That's why a firefly's butt lights up. And in this case, it's lighting up the whole plant. On the right, we're seeing a pig that has these fluorescent proteins coded for by a gene in jellyfish inserted. And it's been inserted in such a way that it only turns on these genes and uses these genes in, it, in its extremities, its nose and its hooves, as you can see. So when this pig is exposed to black lights, I don't know, taken into a nightclub or something, it will light up as you can see here. And it might seem preposterous that we would do these kind of things, but these sort of experiments do have a purpose. And we'll get to that in our next topic. Today, we're talking about how we can trick cells in much the same way that viruses do. So how we can tweak cells, how we can make them 
create certain proteins, copy certain genes, and so on. Last day we talked about DNA replication, and having talked about that, I think it would be a good time to go back and look at the polymerase chain reaction in a bit more detail. We did talk about it earlier, but I think now it'll make a lot more sense. We have a means of copying DNA outside of a cell. We can do this just in a very small tube. And we do this using a machine called a thermocycler or PCR machine. You're seeing that machine right here. It's a rather simple looking machine. It's a rather expensive little machine, but what it does is it heats up and cools down very quickly. Now it doesn't sound that impressive, but it does it really, really fast. So there's a metal plate there and our little tiny tubes would fit into that and that metal plate can be heated and cooled very suddenly. Now the interesting thing about DNA is when you heat it up, you break the hydrogen bonds and it separates into two strands. If we have a DNA polymerase available and we have nucleotides and we have primers, then we can copy the DNA. So this is a way to copy DNA, very specific sequences, outside of a cell. We don't have to bother with putting that DNA into a plasmid first. And here's a closer look at a typical thermocycler or PCR machine. So this is a machine that we have at the college. And when you open up that lid, you've got this metal plate that you can fit your little tubes into. And we're working with very, very small volumes of material here. So usually maybe about 20 to 50 microliters. Remember a microliter is one one thousandth of a milliliter. So these are very small volumes. And again, all this machine does, all that metal plate does, is it heats up and it cools down very rapidly. PCR is really a fairly straightforward process, and we'll go through an animation of how it works in just a little bit. But realize that this is a concept that was understood back in the 70s. People understood that this is a way that you could copy DNA artificially in a lab. Problem was, it was too much work. So what you would do is you would take a tube with your DNA, with DNA polymerase, with nucleotides, and with primers that we'll talk about in a second, and you'd throw that into a 95 degree Celsius water bath. That would cause the DNA to denature. It would split into two separate strands. You could move this to the 60 degree water bath, and what would happen is our primers would bind and also DNA polymerase would bind. After that, we move this to the 72 degree water bath and that DNA polymerase would make a copy of those strands. And then we'd repeat the process. The problem is every time we denatured the DNA, we would also denature the DNA polymerase because it's a protein and it unravels and it stops working. So you'd have to have someone sitting there with a timer doing this, moving things every 30 seconds or so and adding a new drop of enzyme every time we finish the cycle to go back to the 95 degrees Celsius because the enzyme was being destroyed. The concentrations of everything in the solutions changes and it's just so much effort and so much work. It wasn't worthwhile. It was easier to copy DNA in bacteria cells until someone had the smart idea to use DNA polymerase from a species known as Thermus aquaticus. And this is an Archean that's something that's like a bacteria, it's a prokaryote, that can live in really extreme environments. So this particular organism can live in boiling water. You find it in hot springs. So if you go to Yellowstone Park or something like that, all the pretty colors you see in the water are the result of different species of archaea. This critter has uh, DNA polymerase that will not denature. So now, we can automate this. And that's exactly what a guy by the name of 
Harry Mulis did. He was a rather odd guy. He was a biochemist. He was a surfer. Um, he believed he had been abducted by aliens. He's got a very interesting biography if you're looking for something interesting to read. He also talks about how he got high on LSD and talked to a raccoon. So very interesting stuff. But regardless of that, he was a brilliant man and he decided, like, why don't we use this Thermus aquaticus uh, DNA polymerase, which he renamed TAC polymerase, to do this for us. And he came up with a machine as well that would do that. And this machine just, again, cycles between temperatures very, very quickly. We'll have a look at the process here. So first of all, we start out with a tube that contains a mixture of several things. We've got our DNA sample. That's our template. That's the DNA we want to copy. We have primers, which are short little pieces of DNA that are complementary to DNA at the ends of what we want to copy. That'll make more sense in just a moment, but they're similar to the RNA primers that are laid down during DNA replication. We also have nucleotides. The D in this DNTP stands for deoxyribose. So these are DNA nucleotides. The N just means we're going to use all four of them. So we have A's and T's and C's and G's. Then we have our heat stable DNA polymerase. It's called TAC polymerase become, because it comes from that thermus aquaticus, that very resilient organism. There's some other stuff. There's some buffers and salts and so on as well. This is the actual process that the machine goes through. So we take our sample, we mix it up, we throw it into this machine, and the machine is going to heat up to about 96 degrees, somewhere between 95 and 97, for 30 seconds. And that's going to melt or denature the DNA. The DNA will split into two separate strands. Next, we cool it down a bit, usually around 60 degrees or so. And this is the annealing stage. And this is where the primers can bind. And next, we have elongation. This is where that DNA polymerase is going to be active. And it's going to elongate our new strand of DNA, our copied strand. And then we keep going through this process. So after elongation, we go back to denaturation. And this will happen usually about 30 times or so. And each time, we're going to be copying our target DNA. Imagine that we're after a specific piece of DNA in a mixture of lots of DNA. So maybe we take a few cells and we mash them, and we extract all the fluids, including all the genomic DNA, we have that in our tube and we want to amplify or copy one particular gene. That would be our target sequence. That's what we want to make copies of. We need to know a little bit about this. We need to know the DNA sequences at the ends. And that way we can make primers that will bind at the ends and copy that target sequence. The main point so far is just that we have a lot of DNA in our tube. And we're just interested in one small piece of DNA. That's our target sequence, but we can isolate that and copy that. The first step of the PCR process is denaturation. So the two strands are going to split because we've applied some heat and that will break the hydrogen bonds. We have primers that we have designed ahead of time. So you need to know a little bit about the sequence of the DNA you want to copy. So you can make complementary primers. And then there are several companies that will manufacture those primers for you. Usually they're about 20 nucleotides in length. Our primers, when we cool things down a bit, will stick to the appropriate sequences. They will stick to the uh, complementary sequences. And during extension, DNA polymerase, the TAC polymerase, can build off of those primers. Remember that DNA polymerase needs to have a three prime end to build off of. So at the end of our first cycle here, we have copied a piece of DNA. During our next cycle, we're going to copy again. 
So we're going to split the DNA again by denaturing it. We have that annealing phase where it's just cool enough for the primers to bind to their complementary sequences. And then we have our elongation phase where we will build off of those primers. As this goes on, you can see each time we're doubling the amount of DNA that we've made in our tube. And the reason this is so incredible is because it happens very quickly. We don't need cells for this. If we were trying to copy DNA in bacteria, that's a much sloppier process. And we can't isolate out very certain sequences, which we can with this process. I apologize for the quality of this video. It is quite old. It's almost as old as the polymerase chain reaction itself. It's actually the video that I learned off of originally, so it has a special place in my heart. But I actually think it's one of the best videos out there. So with PCR, we start with a mixture of DNA. We might just take some tissues from a plant or from an animal, mash them up with a mortar and pestle, basically, dissolve that in some water, and then go hunting for the piece of DNA that we want to amplify. So there's going to be a whole lot of DNA in here, and we're only interested in a tiny, tiny bit of it. We're interested in one particular gene, for instance. That's our target sequence. We have to know a bit about this target sequence. We have to know its DNA sequence, at least at the ends, as we'll see. The first step of the PCR reaction is that we heat up the DNA to 95 to 97 degrees Celsius, and that causes all of the DNA to denature or melt. It splits into two complementary strands. Now we have our primers. The primers were pre-made, so we again have to know a bit about the sequence at the end of our target, and then we can figure out the complementary sequence. We can send that off to another lab that will make that probe or that piece of DNA, that primer, for us. It will specifically bind to the DNA at the ends of our target, and hopefully it won't bind anywhere else. Once it's bound, then this TAC polymerase, this special type of DNA polymerase that won't denature, comes along and builds off of the primer. It builds off of the three prime end of that bound primer. So after one cycle, we have two copies of the target sequence. We're gonna repeat this cycle. So we heat things up, the strands are going to separate. We cool things down a bit, just to 60 degrees or so, so that the primers will bind. They will seek out their complementary sequences. They're single-stranded, so they will seek out their complementary sequences, and that's the only place they can bind. And then that DNA polymerase will come along and build off of the three prime ends. Now, after the second cycle, we have four pieces of our target sequence. Now we're going to do it a third time. 95 degrees, that is going to separate the uh, strands. Cool it down so that the primers can attach. And then we give this a little while for DNA polymerase to elongate off of the three prime end of the primers. Now at this point, we have two molecules that just consist of our target sequence. Notice that DNA polymerase, it'll keep going. It'll just keep going until it runs out of time, until the DNA is denatured again. And that's why we've got some weird strands here that have all this stuff trailing off. But as we do this more and more and more, we'll end up just making these short little target molecules. Now, after a few rounds of replication, we've got eight target molecules. We don't have any junk attached to the end. And as we go on, we will make more and more and more copies of that. So we get to the point where most of the DNA in the tube is our target DNA that we copied because it's the only thing that we're copying. We're not copying any of the other DNA. So we keep copying this. 
over and over and over again. Usually you do maybe 30, maybe 35 cycles of this and the machine is fully automated. It does that for you. And here by the end of cycle 30, we have a whole lot of our target molecule. So the tube now contains almost entirely our target DNA. And the amazing thing about the polymerase chain reaction is you can start out with just a single cell and you can copy this target and get a lot of it, enough that you can run it through electrophoresis, which we'll talk about in a moment, and see it on a gel. So very, very powerful for all sorts of things, but for forensics, for instance, you can have one cell from your suspect and you can identify someone potentially from the DNA contained within that one cell. Another important tool is something known as gel electrophoresis. What you do here is you make a gel out of something known as agarose. It looks like a really stiff jello. There are little wells in the gel that you can put your DNA into. That's the blue lines that you see here. So the DNA has had a dye added to it just so we can see it more clearly. So you put this gel into a buffer, you submerse it, you add your DNA, and then you run an electric current through it. DNA has a charge. The phosphates on the outside of the DNA molecule are negatively charged. So when you do this, the DNA will run away from the negative electrode towards the positive electrode. As it moves through the gel, it sorts by size. So the DNA has to squeeze through the pores, the openings in the gel, and that means it takes longer for the large fragments of DNA to travel. So what happens is we sort out the DNA into bands based on the size of the pieces. Just looking at that again, we use a micropipetter, which is an instrument that allows us to transfer very precise, very small volumes of liquid. And we pipette our mixture of DNA and dye and glycerol, the glycerol helps the solution sink, into our submersed wells in the agarose gel. Then we run the electric current through that gel and the DNA will sort itself by size. In order to see where the DNA ends up, we need to use a dye of some sort. The old school method is to add something known as ethidium bromide to the mixture of DNA and to the gel as well. You run your gel, so you run electricity through it and you allow the fragments of DNA to sort by size. And then you expose this to UV light and the ethidium bromide will give off visible light. So the bands of DNA will show up quite clearly. Now, ethidium bromide is a carcinogen. It can damage DNA. So if you get it on your skin, that's bad for your cells. So there are some safer ways of doing this, but we need a positively charged dye that will stick to the negatively charged DNA. Let's put all of these things together. And we're gonna come back next class with some more examples of how we use these tools. But here we have a fragment of DNA that has been isolated using PCR. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look for mutations in this particular piece of DNA. We know the exact sequence of this DNA, and we could actually just sequence the DNA, but that takes a bit more time, although it is getting faster and faster. What we could also do though, to figure out if there's a mutation, is look to see if there's been a change in the restriction sites. Remember, restriction sites have a certain sequence. In normal DNA for this particular gene, and it's a gene that codes for part of hemoglobin, normally we have this DDE1 restriction site, and we have four of them. We could take a normal piece of DNA from this area of the chromosome, we could digest it, break it down with the restriction endonuclease known as DDE1, and we would expect to see one piece that's 175 base pairs in size, 
one piece that's 201 base pairs, and then a much larger fragment. Incidentally, base pair refers to a pair of bases, so a pair of complementary bases. We could run our fragments on a gel and see if they match what we expect to see. We expect to see three pieces, three bands, if we have the normal allele for this gene. Now, if there's a mutation, the most common mutation gets rid of one of those restriction sites. It changes the sequence by one nucleotide. That enzyme won't bind, it won't cut it. If we have the abnormal piece of DNA and we cut it with DDE1, we only get two fragments. That's a nice, easy way to see if someone is a carrier for sickle cell anemia. And we'll talk about other applications in our next topic. For now, here's the terminology list, and I'll talk to you soon.